Good afternoon and welcome to this AHDB webinar during which you will learn more about the dairy breeding indexes being released this April. I'm Becky Miles, one of the knowledge exchange managers in the dairy team and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. All attendees are muted. If you wish to claim your Dairy Pro points, please put your details in the question box. This is located by clicking the orange box in the top right hand corner of your screen and clicking on the question box. Please do send your questions in. They are all anonymous and don't wait until the end of the presentation to send them. Our team is working behind the scenes, pulling them all together for me to post to our panel at the end. We are also keen to hear your experiences of using UK breeding indexes when making your breeding decisions. Today we will start with three polls to help us understand what support and resources we can provide to assist you in making your breeding decisions. So the first poll is what is your carving pattern? Please can you select one? Are you all year round, autumn block carving, spring block carving, split block, or maybe you're a third party and you don't have a herd of cows? You could just click on the relevant one, that'd be really useful. Just give you a few seconds to do that. That's great. So we're, we're predominantly all year round in the in the audience today, uh, followed by uh, autumn block and then spring block. No split blocks. OK, that's great. Let's move on to the next poll. It's just coming up. So what primary factor do you consider when deciding what bulls to use for breeding? So is your primary choice production, type, herd genetics, semen cost or relationship with a breeding advisor or herd health. So if you could select one of those, your primary factor. A few more seconds for you to click on those. We should get the result in a second. There we go. So herd genetics, uh, followed by production, uh, type and herd health. Sorry, production and herd health are the same. Uh, then type and then semen cost. That's great. Uh, and then our last poll today. It's just going to come up on the screen. Are you signed up for our herd genetic report? Yes, no, never heard of cows. <laughs> I don't have a herd of cows. I apologize for the spelling mistake in that. <laughs> so just click on yes, no, or you don't have a herd of cows. It just gives us a feeling of who's using the herd genetic report. response. Good, 28% of you are signed up and using it, that's fantastic, and only 21% yet to convince, so that's good. We'll work on that. Thank you very much everybody. Uh, so today we're going to hear from our genetics team at AHDB, Marco Winters and Fern, Win uh, Fern Pearson, in introducing the two new breeding indexes, gestation length and healthy cow. They will explain the move from, also explain the move from a fixed genetic reference base to a rolling base, which is also commencing in April 21. Marco will then give a further um, preview of indexes planned for release later this year. Andrew Rutter, dairy farmer with a passion for breeding, will then share his practical experience of using herd uh, UK genetic indexes when making breeding decisions for his herd and what these new indexes mean for him. Our genetics team of three at AHDB Dairy is led by Marco Winters, Fern Pearson and Victoria Serkin, who is our analyst. Last year, their work included three full genetic and genomic evaluations for the UK dairy industry alongside monthly genomic releases, 
checking adherence to AHDB codes of advertising for semen catalogues and websites of participating breeding companies. That represents about approximately 95% of semen sold in the UK. Alongside that, several updates were introduced to the service in 2020, including the release of digital termititis and an update to the Holstein type merit calculation. So they are busy people. So we will go across now to Mark, Marco, who's going to tell us about the new tra traits that are being released this year. Thank you, Becky. Uh, just checking that you can see my screen now. I'm assuming so. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us at this, uh, this update. And, and hopefully, it's going to be about a half an hour presentation where we'll be talking you through the new updates and, and what you can expect. And, and we do believe that some of these are really exciting new developments that uh, hopefully we can, can help you to breed a better herd uh, in the future. So as, uh, as Becky already introduced, there'll be three of us talking throughout this presentation and uh, hopefully all of us can give you a slightly different angle of information that is available and how you can access it and use it. So Becky has already outlined what we're going to be doing today, so I'm not going to go through this again, but essentially it's a, an overview of what will be coming in April, so that's coming in two weeks' time. And then later on in the year, we're going to be updating another two indexes, feed efficiency and EnviroCow. And I'll just give you the headline figures. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because it's still being developed. Uh, and then finally, Andrew Ruttle will give us a view of what's happening uh, on his farm. So uh, before we start, really, I just wanted to highlight again that well, the reason we can do what we are doing is because a lot of data is being recorded on, on UK dairy farms. And we work very closely together with our data partners, the milk recording organizations in the UK as well as all of the herd books that provide us data. And the combined uh, data sets of well, phenotypes that are being recorded, performance recordings, as well as pedigree information can really allow us to, to make these uh, indexes available to you. And in 2021, we'll continue to announce those by the, the indexes that I'll be talking about today. Apologies for the noise in the background. That's our 15-week-old puppy that's uh, making a bit of a scene, but hopefully she'll be quiet soon. So what are we going to be introducing this uh, April? So the first one that we'll be introducing is a gestation length index. And as the name already suggested, it's an index really to help us manage gestation length. And this could in particular be of, of relevance for farmers who are working on a, a block uh, carving system where they want to tighten the block up or there's some animals that, that are uh, running over uh, that we want to bring back into the block. Uh, the data that we'll be using for this is UK data for carving uh, gestation length. Uh, roughly seven and a half million calving events that are being recorded in the UK where we know the server sire and we can attribute that, uh, that calving to that sire. It's a very heritable trait, 43% heritable, which does mean that actually in, in terms of making changes, genetics has a big part to play. Obviously, management is still about 60% of it, but, but certainly genetics can have a, uh, a big contribution there. And this graph is just showing you roughly the, uh, the distribution that we're finding when we look at uh, progeny of server sires over the years, so that's the complete data set. And you can see that some sires really give us a much shorter gestation than others. And, and those are uh, because of the genetics that the sires uh, contribute to the progeny. On average, when we look at the whole data set, it's about 282 days. But we actually do see that we, when we look at the trend over time, and this is looking at the Holstein trend, uh, that whereas historically uh, bulls and heifers calves were uh, roughly 282 or 281 days. Over the years, that has been declining. And actually, in, tw in 2019, the average gestation length for a Holstein female was about 279 days and a, a bull about a day longer. And that just differences between uh, bulls and females, I guess we're familiar with, and that's certainly what comes out of the data when we look at it. Similarly, when we look at the gestation length over uh, lactation numbers, we also can see a uh, but as cows get older, they tend to have a slightly longer gestation length than, uh, than the younger animals. And again, in our, in our analysis, we do correct for these environmental effects, because what we're really interested in is what's the contributing factor of that server sire, not, not what's there because of the sex of the calf or the, uh, the dam's uh, lactation number. So these corrections are taken into consideration. And what we then end up with is our gestation length PTA. And the way we'll we'll be publishing it on in April is that uh, each point represents the calving uh, gestation length change uh, itself. 
So use it as a management tool. It's, it's not necessarily a breeding tool that we recommend you, you include in your breeding objective. But, but as I said at the beginning, if you want to tighten your block or want to bring some cows forward a little bit, it can be used as a management tool. Roughly the range of the, the very best and the very worst is about 14, 15 days calving and uh, gestation length difference. So it, it is significant. And therefore, just being aware of the choice you're making when, you, when it's of interest to you is, is important. When it then comes to finding bulls that will shorten gestation length, look for the lowest number possible. So in that case, negative gestation length figures are really what you're after. And as the scatter plot represents, it's the these negative gestation length bulls will really bring down uh, the gestation length of their progeny. There is noise around it because obviously um, there's still environmental effects that come into it. And, and even with genetics, it's not always 100% guaranteed. But to stack the odds in your favor, if you select for negative gestation length, uh, you will find that the gestations will be shorter than if, you, if you're starting to use bulls that are at the top end. So with April, we're going to be releasing it on all dairy bulls that have UK progeny information available. So it's not restricted just to Holsteins. We'll be doing it for all of the breeds. Uh, but for Holsteins, we all, will also be running a genomic index. So it does mean that for young bulls who, who don't yet have progeny in the UK, uh, we will be able to make a genomic prediction. Uh, for the moment, that's restricted to Holstein, but we are working on the other breeds as well to see if we can uh, build the, uh, the reference population big enough that we can do it in future. We're also interested in beef sires, and that's uh, already uh, part of the evaluation, and we're looking to roll that out uh, in the future. Then the other development that will come in April is uh, the Healthy Cow Index. And over the next two or three slides, I'll just be explaining to you what that index is. But again, to, to, to set the scenes, uh, well, you are familiar with the existing profit ranking indexes. So we've got our PLI, the Profitable Lifetime Index, which is geared towards all year round calving systems. It's a within breed index that's been around well for the, for the longest. And then more recently, we've introduced system specific indexes so we've got our spring calving index as the name suggests the spring block calving and it's in a cross breed ranking index so we can directly compare bulls from different breeds against each other and then we've got the aci which is specifically geared towards the autumn calving index and and these indexes are made up of a, a range of, of traits so we've got production traits which in pli is roughly a third in sci and aci it's it's slightly less than that and then we've got alongside it a lot of traits that we really include now because we are interested in reducing costs on farm. And a lot of these costs are associated with the health of the animal, the fertility and the longevity of the animal, uh, which we, we class as a, a healthy animal. Then finally, we also got efficiency measurements. So maintenance is in there because we're not interested in just breeding bigger and bigger animals who are less efficient in the system. But when it comes to the, the healthy cow part, which is a uh, sub-index uh, that is included in PLI and will be included into PLI. Uh, what we're pulling out in a single figure there is a well, the, the financial saving that the bull can predict to pass on to the progeny through their better health. And we'll be expressing it as a pound value similar to PLI, uh, and therefore it can be directly subtracted from PLI or included into PLI as we, as we currently do. Uh, and that financial benefit is a is a real cost saving that, that, uh, that those types of genetics can give to you. Now, in terms of the makeup, it's uh, there's 10 traits that go into it. Um, so we've got lifespan of cows that come into it, so the ultimate longevity, but also calf survival is an important element because calf rearing costs are not insignificant. And we really want to make sure that every calf that's born on farm can make it into the milking herd if we choose it to stay on farm. The fertility index is still a significant contributing factor to uh, the overall health and longevity of the animal that we want to capture in this index. Then we've got other health traits, so somatic cell count and the mastitis index are incorporated. Functional type traits, so that's food and leg composite and memory composite, who contribute to a better health of the animal. And we've got our lameness advantage index. And then finally, we've got direct and maternal calving needs who are incorporated into the healthy cow sub-index. Now, all of these traits are not new. Uh, we've been breeding for these traits for a number of years. And, and when we look at the genetic trends of the bulls that are being used in the UK, uh, we did see that in the 80s and 90s, it was a slightly uh, well, worse genetic trend. But since 2000, so the last 20 years or so, we can see a positive genetic trend in healthy cow already because we have been breeding for these traits uh, on their own. 
But what this new index really will, will help us to do is, is easily identify bulls that transmit better health and therefore hopefully you as a, a farmer will be able to identify these sires easier than when it's just broken down into uh, individual PTAs. Well, what does it mean when we start to select bulls on either the top quartile or the, or the bottom quartile for a healthy cow index? Well, how do their progeny perform? And this is retrospectively just looking at the progeny performance of these sires and, and what the, uh, the actual performance is in the UK. Well, the first one that we looked at was lameness incidence. So it's, it is part of the healthy cow index alongside other traits. And what we do see is that the bottom quartile bulls ranked on healthy cow have got a lower incidence of mastitis throughout their lifetime compared to the worst ranking, uh, the top quart or the quartile four when it comes to healthy cow. And those changes are significant and really can contribute to a reduced incidence of lameness on farm uh, for, for using that index. Similarly, when it comes to mastitis incidence, again, uh, the quartile ones or top bulls have got a lower incidence of mastitis throughout their lifetime compared to the, the worst ranking bulls on, on healthy cow. In lactation one is fairly similar because we don't typically tend to find a lot of mastitis cases in the first lactation, uh, but certainly later on as the cow gets older and older, genetics really comes through and, and breeding for better health can really help you to, uh, to reduce the incidence of mastitis on farm. Then the fertility of these animals that, that are ranking well on, on healthy cow, again, by including these uh, the top quartile bulls in your breeding program, you will be able to reduce calving intervals, so fertility will be improved. Um, and again, the worst ranking bulls will have a worst calving interval or a worst fertility uh, on farm. And then finally, the overall longevity of the animals, again, our top performing healthy cow bulls have got a, on average, a, a much longer longevity of their daughters compared to the worst ranking ones. So it's, it shows to you that, that this all encompassing index will do a number of factors all at the same time and therefore can be a really useful in a selection tool when it comes to identifying top healthy bulls. So how to use it? Well, it's an at a glance index to find out bulls that transmit, transmit the best overall health. Um, but we do recommend that you don't use it as a primary selection tool because when it comes to profitability, obviously, we also want our cows to be productive. So the primary selection tools should still remain the profit index, PLI, SCI, ACI, because it does include some additional traits like production and, and maintenance efficiency traits. Uh, but, but if you are using this then as a secondary screening tool, you can use Healthy Cow really to identify bulls that are going to give you that health to improve the, uh, the performance of your herd. So in April, we'll release it for bulls, and then in August, we will also release this, uh, release this index for genomically tested females. The final update that we're going to be doing in April is our uh, change to the genetic reference base. Um, and just as a background, really, why we've got a genetic reference base, well, it's there to give us information how animals compare against the average. And so we need to set some sort of base number to say, well, how much better is this cow or this bull compared to the average animal in the UK? And in order to do that, we, we um, artificially set this base animal to zero. So every animal can deviate either to the, to the better or worst of that uh, average animal. But because we make genetic progress each year, that average also creeps up as, we, uh, as the national herd improves. And to account for that, periodically we recalculate the base. And up until now, we've been doing that every five years. And that means that every five years, and the last one was in April 2020, you see quite a significant change. Bulls all of a sudden drop quite dramatically in PLI uh, and production traits because we've we recalibrated our genetic base over a five-year period. And with genomics, because genetic progress has been a lot more rapid than it has been historically, those jumps can be quite significant and uh, quite dramatic when you start to look at bull proofs or even your own herd genetic report. Uh, numbers can look quite different. Uh, and also the other downside of doing it every five years is that gradually that base shifts from the national mean. So when you think you are using a positive bull, actually because the national herd is also improved, although the figures on the bull may still be positive, it's comparing it against an animal that's uh, maybe a bit too historic. So what we'll be starting to do in April this year is we move to a, a yearly update rather than every five years. And that means every year we'll all only have a small adjustment to make sure that we, uh, we keep the genetic base current. Because our last change was, was April 2020, uh, this year you're really not going to see much of a change. Bulls can maybe change by 10, 20 points PLI. Breeds vary a little bit in, in how they change, but it's, uh, it's fairly insignificant. 
So uh, how do we set it? Well, it's going to be uh, based on a four-year window representing the average age of the cow. So in the UK, the average age is roughly six and a half years when it comes to, to cows milking. And in order to get that, we take the average of cows born 2013, 14, 15, and 16. And each year we roll that on by one year to keep the, the base current. Um, but by doing that, it means that bull indexes give you a better reflection of the impacts they can have, as I explained earlier, because the, the genetic base will stay a lot more current and, and really is much more representative of the national herd uh, at that time when the bull indexes are being published. Final point just to highlight is that a uh, base change does not affect the ranking. So it doesn't mean that all of a sudden we're going to re-rank bulls because we're doing a base change. It's, uh, it's just all animals will be affected in the same way. And it also does mean that it, it doesn't just affect older animals more than young ones. Sometimes uh, you hear stories about, well, this bull has gone through one or two base changes and therefore looks worse. But that's not true. The, the base affects all animals equally. So whether it's a young animal that's only just recently been born or a 10-year-old bull, each of these will be affected in the same way and it does not affect the ranking. So that's a, an overview of uh, the April changes and later on in, in questions we can come back to some of that. Uh, Fern will now give us an update on where you can find this information uh, in your for your breeding program. Over to you, Fern. Thanks, Marco. Um, so some of you will have noticed, hopefully as well, that last year, along with all the other things that uh, Becky mentioned, we did also transition into the, uh, the main HDD website. Um, so these a uh, couple of slides are just to let you know where to find this information. So the Dairy Breeding and Genetics does have its own landing page, um, and you can access that through the link that Becky's also mentioned earlier in the uh, webinar. On this page, there's um, the, the ability to go to PLI, SCI, or ACI specific ranking lists. Um, but also, in addition to that, there's the ability to search for a specific bull either on the PLI or the, the ACI and SCI um, across breed indexes. So, when um, proofs are released uh, in a couple of weeks' time, you can either look at the available bull list or you can search for a specific bull. Uh, for this information. Further down that page, um, there's also information on fact sheets and guides. So for these new traits, those fact sheets will be available from this page. But we've also got some videos, podcasts, and also historic webinars if there's other information you'd like to catch up on on that page. Um, so as I mentioned in a couple of weeks' time, uh, when those proofs are released, they'll be available through, or these new traits will be available in your and your available bull reports that can be found on the HDB website. Uh, specifically on the fact sheets, I've just highlighted here a mock fact sheet that you'll, you'll find online. Your healthy cow will be that top trait within your management trait section, and gestation length can be found just below uh, the, the calving age PPAs. Um, that's if your, your breed has uh, the calving age PPAs uh, available to it. Now, with the new traits, sometimes there's a, a little bit of a lag with them appearing in the breeding company catalogues. Um, so the information does get sent to the companies, um, but it can sometimes be a little bit uh, of a period before those get updated into the, the catalogue format. If these PTAs are of interest to you for making breeding decisions, they are uh, straight away available on the HDB website. Um, and I'm sure um, as the developments go along within the breeding companies, They'll start to appear there in their publications too. So finally, it will be I'm just touching on the cow information. So as Marco said, these traits are only going to be available for bulls from April, um, with a couple of traits being available for cows that are genomically tested in August. Um, those of you that are um, using the hard genetic report, which we saw earlier, is quite a number of you, um, and anyone who is really milk recording um, with CIS, NMR. Dale Farm or QMMS, you can access the herd genetic report to get your herd genetic information. Included in this is your lifespan and calf survival PTAs. We've also got somatic cell counts and mastitis PTAs, as well as uh, fertility index and limit advantage. So those healthy traits that um, Marco has kind of pointed out that are in the healthy cow are still available through the herd genetic report. So although you won't have the overarching sub-index, those specific traits are there to be uh, selected on. I think Andy will cover that a little bit more 
uh, in his presentation of how he's using the hard genetic for information. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fern. Um, so, as Fern said, that information at least can be uh, found and is available um, and later the year in the year also on, on females. So the, the other update then that I'll just briefly want to talk you through over the next five minutes or so is two new indexes that we're going to be launching later in the year, um, which again we think are, are going to be exciting additions to what's already being made available through our services. Uh, the first one is a new feed efficiency genomic evaluation and this is a, a trade that's been long talked about and, and really of significant interest because of the, well, the cost that's associated with feeding cows. And obviously it's a trait that we would like to influence through genetics. Uh, for some time we have known that this is a trait that's heritable, uh, but unfortunately because of the cost of collecting individual feed intake records, it's, it's been prohibitive to do something. But genomics is now enabling us to do um, phenotype recording on a much smaller population, but by allowing then that genomic information to be expanded out over a whole population for every animal that's being genomically tested. Well, indirectly, uh, we have already been making improvements in feed efficiency, because if you think about the dilution factor, so individual animals are much more productive than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. And as a consequence, for every kilogram of milk that we produce on farm, we don't have to feed as much, because there's a, an inherent indirect efficiency that we're breeding into these animals. But what we really want to do is by producing these genetic indexes is pinpoint the animals that are, that are better than average, so which animals are even better converters of feed into milk uh, than the average, and therefore really well, hone in on, onto the efficiency part into that uh, genetic equation. The next couple of slides explain you a little bit more about it, but before I move on, just uh, so the second one that we'll be introducing is a new EnviroCow index, and as the name already suggests there, that really is an index that's been uh, designed to help us find animals that are can help us to, to uh, reduce the carbon footprint of our product that we're producing on farm and really also as a, a tool to help the industry achieve net zero, uh, the ambition that exists uh, by 2040. So the first one that I'll be talking about is, is feed efficiency and this work has been made possible because of the collaboration that we've got together with SIUC up in Scotland. And really the, the credit for this is to, to go through the team that's been working on this and Binji Lee in particular, she's been leading uh, this piece of work uh, under the, the guidance of Mike Coffey at SIUC. Uh, Lang Hill has probably been one of the world's longest uh, uh, recording herds who've been looking at feed efficiency and because of that we've got a wealth of, of data available in the UK that can help us to calibrate. So Lang Hill, SIUC herd have been recording feed intake on roughly 800 Holstein cows over a number of years now. And as part of that, they've been uh, phenotyping or recording dry matter intake very uh, well, efficiently and effectively. So daily dry matter intake records are available on individual cows over a number of lactations. So it's not just the first lactation or a period of a lactation, but it's, uh, it's throughout the lifetime of the animal first up to fourth lactation that we'll be recording it and therefore it becomes a more informative lifetime uh, dry matter intake record. In total, there's just over 150,000 daily dry matter intake records that we can include in the analysis when it comes to calibrating our genomics. The heritability of, of feed efficiency is moderate, so it's 18%, which is uh, not too dissimilar to, from quite a few traits that we've got and much more heritable than some of the health traits that we are, we're familiar with. So, Fertility, for example, would be a lot less heritable, but we know that genetics can make a significant contribution. And, and therefore, we do believe that feed efficiency can really be beneficial in, in really helping us to pinpoint and improve the efficiency of our dairy herd. Genomic predictions for dry matter intake have already been established and calibrated, so they are ready to roll out. Um, and what we have seen when we look at the, the top and bottom bulls that are coming through in, in terms of progeny performance, but there's roughly a three and a half kilogram dry matter intake difference between the top and, and bottom. Well, then work that up to a, a full lactation, three or five day lactation, that, that already shows you that the, the difference between the, the top and bottom bulls is something like a ton of dry matter intake per lactation. So it's a, a significant difference in terms of feed intake. And obviously we know that feed intake is, is also geared or um, uh, or guided by the production of that animal. So dry matter intake itself may not be a breeding objective that we want to do. But feed efficiency, so how much does she eat for 
the amount of product that she produces is really the trade of interest. And so what we are working on now is to, uh, to come up with that feed efficiency metric, uh, which will include these dry matter intake evaluations as the base to start from, because that's the, uh, the missing piece that we didn't know up until now. We do know how much milk they produce. We do know what the life rate of these animals are through, through some of the other traits that we collect. So uh, that enables then us to, to come up with a feed efficiency index that we'll be launching later this year. The second one, and this is closely linked to feed efficiency, because uh, uh, in the environmental footprint or the, the carbon footprint of the animal is, is uh, well guided by methane emissions. And we do know that feed intake and methane are very highly correlated on the genetic level. It's uh, something like 0.99. So if, if we can measure feed intake, we also have a pretty good idea on the methane emissions of these animals. And again, alongside it, we also know uh, in terms of feed intake and, and predicted feed intake from traits like the productivity of these animals, the life rate of the animals, the fertility, the longevity. There's quite a few genetic traits already that exist that can help us to calculate well what's the the uh, the environmental footprint uh, of these types of genetics on farm. And so the Enviro Cow Index is really geared towards well how can genetics help us achieve net zero emissions. Previous studies, uh, because of that indirect effect that I've talked about earlier, the dilution effect, have already indicated that cattle breeding has contributed roughly 0.8% um, reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions equivalents per year, so, so not insignificant. But this index hopefully will help us again to fine tune and pinpoint the genetics that can get us even above that, that, uh, that level that we've been achieving on average. So the Enviro Cow Index that we'll be introducing later this year uh, gives us the estimated uh, CO2 per kilogram of product and that's derived from the genetic information that we've got, including feed intake. Uh, we'll be introducing it as a standalone index initially, so it's, it's not directly going to be incorporated into, into PLI, but um, because it can then pinpoint which types of genetics are doing well, it may be able to uh, may allow us to, to shape the, the herd of the future. And also it can help us to highlight, well, how is genetics contributing to this, uh, to this target that we're setting ourselves? And, and really, I think from a breeding sector, it's, uh, well, it's responsible that we also do our bit and it's not just genetics or management that, uh, that has to solve the problem. But I think through genetics, we can also contribute towards that, that ambition. So that is a, uh, a quick snapshot of uh, well, the, the information that we will be making available to you this year. And to summarize it, so for April, we've got three new developments. So the first one is gestation length. And just as a reminder that if you want to shorten your gestation period, look out for the negative sires that can shorten that gestation length. The healthy cow index, and there we do want the higher, the more profitable bulls to come out. And that really is going to help you to, to improve your health on farm. And it's a sub-index included into the PLI index. And then the final one is the introduction of the rolling genetic base to better reflect our current herd genetics and make uh, the, the figures more meaningful when it comes to selecting bulls that can improve your herd. And then later in the year, we, we will introduce the feed efficiency and Enviro Cow Index. Today, I've just given you a very quick overview of what it is, but before we launch them, we will do a, a more detailed um, explanation of what that information is and how best to use it in, into your breeding programs. And then the final point is Fern highlighted, more information is available. We will also be putting fact sheets on the website just to give you uh, that detailed information. But when it comes to finding out where your herd sits on the herd genetic report or how the bulls that you are using uh, perform, uh, please do make use of that information because it's it ultimately setting the genetic base right for your herd can really set up your business uh, much better longer term. So talking about the practical applications, I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Rutter, who will be uh, giving his experience as a uh, practicing dairy farmers and, and how to use the information and uh, I guess what he's doing on farm. So Andy, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm certainly uh, practicing to be a dairy farmer. Hi, uh, my, my name is Andrew Rutter. Um, I'm a herd manager and partner at Clayton Farm uh, Partners here in Cheshire. I worked as a sire and lesser for Genus and that was there for 18 years until the opportunity arose to, to come home and join the partnership three years ago, which I felt was a, something I really wanted to do. We have 370 milking registers, registered Holsteins and uh, rear our own replacements. And when I first arrived, we were selling around eight and a half thousand litres per cow per year. 
uh, with a peg rate of 18% and a very low uh, replacement rate, which uh, well down in the low teens, which sounds really good, but also means we, we had a lot of old cows uh, to manage. So, as one of my roles uh, is the breeding strategy of the herd, I first wanted to assess what I had, you know, what, 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 what have I actually got out there to work with? And uh, the first port of call for me was working uh, out my genetic potential. I, I use a herd genetic report on AHDB, which is available to all milk recording herds, as, as, as we've heard, uh, as a really good assessment of, uh, of what we had. Our herd uh, at that point uh, was in the top 60% for profitability, uh, so just below average, with our young stock uh, in, the, in the top 65%. Uh, I could see from the breakdown in trends that, that genetic improvement was stalling, and my young stock was no higher than my herd, which would be uh, fairly unique uh, with, with a lot of dairy herds. Also of a concern for me was, was below average health traits, notably fertility and longevity, and a pretty low uh, production base, uh, which was something we were definitely seeing on, on farm. It was, it was hard to get a lot of milk, certainly out of our two-year-olds. Next, I got away from the computer and went out and visually assessed the herd, uh, noting some points. We had great structure and really good balanced cows uh, with very good udders, but they were on the big side, um, uh, something of particular concern for a few reasons. Uh, we have, um, uh, as you've seen on, on the slide before, we've got a large farm, but there's a lot of old uh, cubicles and the pile I'm still paying off for, and neither of which uh, uh, um, lends itself to me getting uh, cows any bigger in terms of having any investment to do that. So, and purely as a, an indication of efficiency, in these days of tight margins, I, I didn't really want to have to pay for feed purely to help big cows be big cows. I also wanted to make any improvements I could on lameness or mastitis. I'm the man that does the feet, so uh, um, lame cows is something that, that drives me nuts anyway. And uh, uh, the cost of mastitis is something I wanted to, to minimise it, 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 if I could. So then uh, we start looking at the farm itself. It's called clay hanger, so it gives you an idea of what our soil uh, is like. We can grow lots of high quality forage, uh, but have a very short uh, grazing window due to, due, due to that clay. Uh, so fundamentally changing uh, our all year round system to a block system doesn't really seem practical and uh, we tie that in with who our milk buyer is and that they want lots of milk uh, with a very uh, level dairy and high hygiene but don't overpay on components. Again pushing away from uh, um, options of moving towards a more block grazing system. So my next stop is uh, assessing what, what genetics are most suitable to bring down, uh, to bring into the herd. It's all from semen. We run a closed herd uh, for many reasons, uh, primarily health. So the only way to improve it is, is, is through sire selection. As a UK farmer, there are um, three relevant overall indexes to use, and Marco spoke far more eloquently about them, PLI, SEI and ACI. Spring carbon and autumn carbon indexes, as I com commented about previously, doesn't really suit our, our future goals, so PLI is my starting point. One of my favourite parts is, of it is its actual name. You know, profitable lifetime index is, is something that, that we're driving for. We want to get the most of, of, of top effort for an all year round uh, uh, system, but my advice and certainly something I use here is not to follow it blindly, setting stipulations for what is important to you, uh, blend of health and uh, Apologise, everyone. Andy's obviously having problems with his sound. Andy, if you just turn your mic off, but keep the uh, and sorry, not turn your camera off, it might help with the signal. Well, we've lost Andy for the minute. Okay, have we lost right. them all together or? <laughs> I'm not sure. <clears throat> there oh, he is. He's back, back again. <laughs> well done, Andy. You, lost your, you started is off it, explaining it, how to use PLI and, and what you're doing to use PLI or? What, what I'm using. Um, uh, so, can you hear me now, all right? Is yes, we can. Just, thanks, Andy. Okay. So, um, I start to, to select on uh, PLI, it's, it's perfect for an all year round system, uh, but 
my advice and, and certainly something I use here is not to follow it blindly. S set stipulations for what, what's important to, to you and, and, and your, your system. I am going to sit, switch off that webcam to see if that. Your quality is um, good. Is it still working okay? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Okay. So, um, as I said, it's a great blend of health and production traits. But uh, so my starting point now is I tend to be selecting for for balls in the the high 700s and in, into the 800s as my first cutoff uh, for size selection. Then I start to fine tune. There are some tremendous component balls that rank really high on, on PLI, suiting many farms. But for me, the, the, and the genetics we have here as our starting point, and the cow I'm trying to breed, um, some of those balls would short, fall short on, on production levels, certainly on, on milk and milk solids uh, 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 potential. So I, I tend to set a minimum of 700 kilos of milk. Uh, but with that, I also look for parity on percentages. So typically around 70 kilos of combined fat and protein. As I stated, uh, our milk buyer wants litres over a certain certain percentage, but they don't pay much more for, for that. But I don't want to chase just water, as the contract can change far faster than we can change our genetics. And for me, it's nice to know that potential is there if I need need it. It's, it is an expensive hobby feeding for, for components if it's not in the genes. And there's, we also know there's a really good link, a relationship with good components and good health traits, which is, again, something I'm looking for. The next trait I uh, select for it, it on is maintenance. Um, I have to stop my cows getting bigger and need to start reducing size. So I look for a, a negative on, on, on maintenance or parity at worst. And there are more bulls becoming available at, at the sharp end, which gives me uh, lots of opportunities to, to exploit that. Uh, I, I then start to sort on, on traits that are important uh, with the management side. So fertility, man, mastitis, ensuring I don't pick any poor balls for these traits. PLI is great at doing most of the legwork, but occasionally one ball will slip through uh, the net uh, because it's particularly good in other areas. But those are traits that I don't want to put any weaknesses in my herd knowing from where I came from. So that will start to give me a long list and then I'll run a secondary uh, uh, sort, kicking out poorer balls for the particular new, newer traits that you've seen um, in, in recent times from AHDB which would be mastitis, uh, lameness and TB. I'm a Cheshire dairy farmer, so those things uh, uh, affect me every day. And anything I can do to reduce incidences of, of those traits are, are, are very key to, to the management and, and uh, profitability of the herd. We use 100% genomic balls at home, so I use them um, accordingly, trying to spread my risk. And I usually select around seven to 10 new balls each proof run. Um, I try to spread risk not only on the number of bulls I use, but also on their pedigree. So when I've done my sort, I, I tend to pick the best two or three uh, sons from a particular sire. And the next highest bull might be the fourth son, but I would move further down uh, and, and select different bloodlines to make sure I'm trying to spread risk as, as, as much as possible. Um, and then with pretty much every genetics company uh, you, you work with, um, they will offer a mating program which, which helps with the complementary matings um, and certainly you can then start to set your inbreeding maximums. There's also a really good uh, tool on AHDB if you want to do it independently uh, before your, your semen uh, rep turns up. It gives you an idea of, of, of what, what's available for you and for me the program offers a great way of controlling recessives as well as uh, maximising genetic progress. So Marco if you could just move, move it on. So this is um, an up-to-date uh, line and we can start to see the progress that we're seeing in, in certainly in the young stock. We're now, our young stock actually is in the, in the top five percentile um, and um, the, the herd's seen the marked increases in PLI in production while still taking up those percentages, which I'm, I'm really pleased with. But I've not had to uh, compromise on, on the health traits. You know, we've seen a really good trend um, in, in the health traits. And I've turned that corner on maintenance. You know, we, we, I'd, I'd like it to be better than that, but we're certainly seeing um, we've slowed the rate of, uh, of, of how much bigger my cows are getting and, in fact, turned the corner to, to start reducing size. Um, so it's OK with all this talk, but am I actually seeing the benefit uh, on, on the farm itself? And I spent years in my previous role helping farmers understand the value of genetics and seeing the results on farm. But boy, it's brilliant seeing it in your own cows. 
um, our first generation of, of heifers coming through are noticeably more productive. You know, we haven't had a, a, a big change of how we manage our cows. Uh, you, you know, no new sheds going up. It's, it's, it's pretty much the same system as, as when I first came home, but we are seeing a, a higher will to milk in, the, in, the, in those two-year-olds. And typically, you know, they're up, a, up around a thousand litres uh, a, a cow as, as, as a two-year-old. Um, as, as I say, without those massive changes in, in management. We're now selling nine and a half thousand litres per cow per year, um, and we've got a far higher percentage of, of, of heifers. In fact, at the moment, you know, on twice a day, we're, we're selling 35 litres uh, of milk per day. So we're definitely seeing uh, production uh, benefits, but we're also seeing uh, fertility improvements with that. The preg rate's now at 24, 25%, uh, which, you know, you can explain a little bit with some of the... Um, uh, um, having a younger herd, but I'd counter that with, we, you know, we use a lot more sex semen in, in our milking herd, and we're not really seeing any 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 cost of that. So, um, as I look forward, I'm really looking forward to the new genetic traits coming through, particularly feed efficiency, which will be one of my first uh, selection criteria uh, when I uh, when I select. I've always been quite jealous of the pig and poultry industry for having that feed efficiency score. It's, it's that measure of true efficiency is so important in, 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 in a, uh, uh, what would you say, an emotive time for reducing uh, inputs about how we produce our food. And ultimately, it's our bottom line. If we can um, turn that uh, raw product into something that we can sell as efficiently as possible, that's definitely what we're looking for. The other thing is when a new trade comes along that would have uh, a, a key impact on, on certainly the indexes, it tends to mix the pot in terms of what bloodlines are available at the, at the top end. And people that are worried about inbreeding, suddenly you'll have a new raft of bulls that you can start to concentrate on, which will which will help us uh, uh, drive forward. So that's that's really it in a nutshell, where we are today, how, um, how pleased I am uh, about the um, genetic progress that I've seen in the herd itself, and actually seeing that um, day to day with, with the cows that I manage. So. I'll, I'll hand back to Marco and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. That was Thanks brilliant, much. Andy. Thank you so much. You put it all so succinctly and you know, you've walked the walk and now you're talking the talk. It's fantastic. Thank you. It's really valuable. Uh, so we've got lots of questions coming in. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, so without further ado, we'll crack on with the first question. Um, this is for Marco. Is there any risk of shortening gestation length too much? that might cause negative effects in the calf? Okay, um, well, it's a good question. So I guess just to, the first point is, again, just to use it as a management tool. So don't just use it as a breeding tool constantly to reduce your, or shorten your gestation length. Um, but the other thing is, because we do publish uh, genetic indexes for calf survival as well as uh, cow longevity, Obviously, we don't want to be using bulls that have got really short lactation lengths, but then have to compromise because their calf survival is, is too poor. And when it comes to breeding decisions, all those breeding tools like calf survival are critically important. So it's a good good question, but I guess because we do monitor calf survival, I'm, I'm not concerned that indirectly we'll be, uh, be making that worse. And, and in actual fact, when we look at the trends for calf survival, that's been an improving picture because that's now uh, being selected for and, and used in breeding. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Marco. Again, on gestation length, uh, will the value be a cross breeds ranking or individual breed? Um, so the analysis is done as, on an across breed level. Uh, when it comes to publishing it on the PLI scale, we'll be representing it on the breed that you're looking at. So mm -hmm. Holstein bulls will be compared against each other, Jersey bulls will be compared against each other. But when it comes to looking at your ACI, your or SCI, which are across breed lists, at, at those rankings you will find that uh, they will be comparable. So immediately you can say, well, how much shorter or longer is this Holstein bull versus the Jersey bull that I'm interested in, and what impact does it have on gestation length? And we do see some breed differences. Uh, in actual fact, the, the Holstein and Friesians are probably on the shorter side, whereas some of the bigger breeds, the brown Swiss Montbelliards, are slightly longer. In gestation length but when it comes to individual bull PTAs it's really the individual that's important and not just the average of that breed. Okay excellent right I'm going to spread the love we'll, we'll give this one to Fern. Is functional type in the healthy cow value the same as current type PTAs? So um, the, the type that we use in the, the PLI, the SCI and the ACI is the 
overall foot and leg and overall mammary ETAs. And those are the ones that are reflected in the healthy cow index. So it's not the individual type linears, it's the overarching foot and leg and mammary. Okay, great. Okay, back to Marco. Can you apply feed efficiency index to grazing animals as a reference population based around uh, based on house cows and rations? Um, it is a good question, and I guess we are fortunate when it comes to the Lang Hill uh, herd and the trials they've been running. Is is over the years they've been running essentially two lines, select line and a, uh, a, an average lines in terms of genetic merit, but also two feeding regimes. Uh, they've been running one much more intensive feeding regime and one that's much more extensive. When we look at the genomic prediction between the two, so does a genomic prediction calibrated on our high feeding ration work on the lower feeding ration? Actually, the, the correlations are very high. So from that data, it gives us confidence that it's, it is applicable. Uh, when it comes to the, the extreme grazing systems, I guess at the moment we don't really have that data available to us to, to give you 100% confidence, uh, but certainly within the feeding regimes that exist in the Lang Hill herd where they are trying to mimic intensive and extensive systems, we do see that these genetics do translate onto both systems well. That's great. Thank you, Marco. Uh, again for Marco, what will the reliability of the feed efficiency evaluations? Are you getting dry matter intake from other countries to increase the reference population and therefore the reliability? Oh. Um, so again, the, the exact number will be available when we start to publish it. At the moment, it will be a lot lower than the traits we're, we're, well, we're familiar with typically, because the, if you think about production traits, we've got millions of cows that we've collected milk data on, and therefore our genomic prediction is very accurate. When it comes to feed intake, we've got a much smaller reference population. Within the herd, when we do the calibration, it comes out around about 35% reliability on the cows. On the bulls that are a little bit further removed, it, it is lower, but, but we are working on trying to bump it up before we release it to industry. We are in discussions with international partners to see if we can exchange data, uh, but as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of IP associated with this and uh, it's a sensitive area, but we're working on it and hopefully by the time we go live, we, we may have made some connections that allow us to do that. Okay, lovely. Right, question for Fern. Will the rolling genetic base cause confusion if people are looking at out-of-date figures? Older catalogues will show bulls having a higher index, so will AI companies have an incentive to be slow in updating their catalogues? As if. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, what I'd like to say is, as we've pointed out, we do a code of advertising, um, which a lot of breeding companies participate in in the UK. As part of that, we do ask them to publish the date of the evaluation. You should be able to see that those catalogues or those proofs are, are out of date and that's not the most up-to-date information. I suppose the other thing with the rolling base is that each time we publish, we're publishing on more information. We're publishing on more reliable information because more data has come in since the last time we published. And so whenever there's a new release, April, August or December, make sure that you're looking at the latest figures because Although catalogue may not be reproduced, we will have produced different figures based on more daughter information and more lactations coming in. So it's always worthwhile to keep an eye on the, the latest figures that are available. That's a really good tip. Thanks, Fern. Uh, right, back to Marco. How, could genetic, how can genetic tools such as those discussed today be best utilised in a herd that is cross-breeding? Um, so for all of these indexes, because we make them available on a cross-breed basis, you can incorporate them well, as part of your selection tool. So if you, if you are cross-breeding, my recommendation would be to, to look at the ACI or SCI rankings. Uh, I know that these are more geared towards spring or autumn block, but if you are an all-year-round calving system, maybe the ACI index would be a good one to look at. Because on that system, if you go to our website and go into the ACI section, all of the bulls will be compared against each other. And there you will find the production traits, the health traits, all comparable. Uh, and that will include gestation length. For the moment, the healthy cow index is a within breed index. Um, so there it becomes a little bit more difficult. And the reason we didn't introduce it yet on the SCI and ACI is just because we didn't want to overcomplicate the message. It's a, it's a single figure per bull at the moment. In time, we may decide to introduce a SCI healthy cow version or an ACI healthy cow version, but the individual component traits are available. So lifespan, fertility, lameness, you can directly compare bulls against each other and make that selection decision. When it comes to feed efficiency, 
initially that will be a Holstein only index, so that will be more difficult to uh, to roll out. Uh, but EnviroCow we will roll out again on a, on a cross breed base. Okay, great. Uh, back to gestation length. Will it be included in the block carving indexes in the future? At the moment, our thinking is that we keep it as a separate management tool. Uh, and certainly for all year round carving systems, it probably, although there may be a slight financial benefit of shortening gestation length, it's not significant enough. So we're not going to incorporate it into PLI. There is some discussion to see if we shouldn't be including it into SCI and ACI, where obviously shortening the block uh, or tightening up the block is much more significant. Uh, but for the moment, it's not in future updates of SCI, ACI, it may well be. Yeah. Okay, right. Question for Fern. Again on gestation length, has it been influenced by sex semen? Is there a different index score for sexed against conventional? Uh, very good question. Um, with regards to identifying sex semen, we're really limited on that at the moment. There's no way for us to identify whether a sex straw has been used um, on farm compared to uh, a conventional one. We are, however, in conversations with um, NMR and CIS to see whether there is a way that we can start getting batches identified as sexed. But sadly, there's there's not been a straightforward um, solution to that one yet. When we are able to identify um, sex straws versus conventional straws, then yes, that's something that we'll take into consideration with uh, with the traits that that's appropriate for. The, okay, thanks. Just to add to that one, just to, uh, so, but because we do know the sex of the calf that is being born. And we do correct for the sex of the calf. So if, if a farmer is only using sex semen and getting 90, 95% half a calves, obviously that does come out in the data that's being collected and we will correct for the sex of the calf in that analysis. So whether a farmer is using sex or not doesn't influence the bull PTA. Okay, so this next question is linked and we may have, or it may have answered it sufficiently. Will the gestation length apply to male and female calves alike? With sex semen and 90% heifers, how will this affect the calculation? So yeah, we do correct for the sex of the calf in the analysis as I explained. So the, the, the figure that we publish is an average across the sex of the calves. If you're only using sex semen, you can actually improve your gestation length because on average, roughly there'll be a day shorter uh, than what we publish the figures for. Uh, on the other hand, if you're getting if you're using conventional semen and you're going to get 50% bulls, then probably half of them will have slightly longer gestation length. But, so the, the figure that we publish is an average across both sexes. Okay, uh, this is quite a specific question. In an era when where genomics have become so strong, is there still a place for cow families like Cookie Cutter, Halos, or similar? Andy, maybe that's one for you. Yeah, go for it, Andy. Um, I'm still uh, uh, my uh, previous role. Size stack still still wins. I, I think there's still there's still a benefit. You know, that I think it's 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 part of the mix. Uh, I, I I think you need to get your size stacks right as, as most importantly but then i think the cow families is is the bit that sort of takes you from a good uh, score to a, a really good score so that would be uh, my experience I, I i think sometimes we romanticize about it a little bit too much when you look at the hard figures but there is definitely something there on the, on the female line it would just for me it would be down the list compared to making sure i've got the right balls in the in the in the, in the size stack I don't know if Marco strongly disagrees, but that would that would be that would be my take. I agree with you. I think when it comes to bull selection, I think the cow families are probably less relevant now. The figures are so reliable that actually the, the figures will tell you how good that bull is going to be, irrespective of which family it originated from. But when it comes to the cows on your own farm, I think the knowledge you have in certain cow families can help you to fine tune. But but don't compromise genetics over sentiment. I guess as Andy's. Uh, highlighted. Okay, uh, this is going to be the last question because we're running out of time. Uh, we'll give it to Fern. On her genetic report sign up, is it worth noting what actual carving system you operate? Currently where everyone's included together, it could be useful to compare index with other similar herds and also useful information for AHDB to evaluate actual real impact of indexes, particularly for SCI and ACI. Oh, you're on mute. We've lost you, Fern. Sorry, uh, uh, technical <laughs> issue there for not clicking the button. Uh, that's quite a long one. Um, so, yes, I think um, maybe gathering that information to find out um, which which index or what 
having system you're operating would be beneficial. I suppose where it's maybe a little bit um, where you'd probably be using a, a mixture of, of both would be if you're say cross uh, cross breeding but all year round calving you might use a mix of the, the PLI and the ACI um, as Marco said or if you're you're a split block you might be looking at um, SCI and ACI um, but yeah we are always developing um, the tools that we have and um, yeah that information would be quite useful to, to feed into how things are, are well how the tools being used who's using it. Uh, and those things. We do get a little bit of information on how, how users are interpreting the or interacting with the tool um, in the background so we can see whether some users are going for the ACI or, or SCI. So we do get that, that information in the background, but I suppose getting it straight from, from the users when you sign up is beneficial as well. Maybe in terms of benchmarking, just very quickly, I know we're running over, but but when, when it comes to benchmarking, because we've got the back data, we do know the calving patterns of the herd. So we do try to benchmark spring block calving herds against them, themselves and, and autumn block calving herds against themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, today. Thanks, Mark and Fern, for all you deliver for our industry. And a big thank you to Mr. Unflappable, Andy Rutter. What a star. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience and your passion for breeding. It's been really invaluable for all of us. And I'm sure your, our audience will have taken a lot away today. Thanks for all your questions and comments. I'm sorry we weren't able to answer all the questions. We will try and get a response to you uh, by the end of the week if we didn't answer your question. Um, as mentioned, all our breeding tools and resources are available on the AHDB website. Uh, be, please don't be a stranger. If you have any questions and you can't find the answer on the website, please call either Marco Fern or one of your, uh, your local knowledge exchange manager. Uh, we're only too happy to help you. So it just uh, remains for me to thank everybody again for joining us and have a very good day. Goodbye. <laughs>